Hi, I'm Catherine Clark from Syntax Strategic. And I'm Cameron Groom from Microbics Biosystems. Thanks for joining us for Diagnostics Beyond the Lab. On this podcast, we speak with industry leaders in the diagnostic testing and health community about discoveries, challenges, and their vision of the way forward in their fields. And Cameron, today we're going to talk about molecular point of care testing through the lens of those on the front lines in Australia and in Canada, two large countries with remote communities and extreme climate challenges. Thanks, Catherine. And to review the goals and obstacles in this kind of work, we have two very distinguished guests joining us today. They're both with Cepheid, the maker of the gene expert system and a global leader in molecular diagnostics. We're honored to host Dr. Stephen Badman, Director of Medical and Scientific Affairs with Cepheid in Australia, and Dr. Scott Sudgeton, Director of Medical Affairs with Cepheid here in Canada. Welcome and thank you, Steve and Scott. Uh, Steve, let's start with a bit of an overview of what's happening in Australia with point of care testing, uh, specifically, you know, where and how are residents being served by point of care testing and, and what kind of tests are being made available? Yes, thanks, uh, uh, Cameron and Catherine, for, for that warm introduction. Um, I think the, the the probably the bigger question for me is where is it not being used in Australia? Um, I think that uh, we now have a, an install base of around about uh, 800 systems operating in Australia, and you know I think it's it's a probably an inalienable fact that uh, expert enables access to molecular testing just about anywhere, and with that in mind, uh, what we've seen um, is a uh, uh, an increase in its use, uh, its best class uh, in menu use across many different settings in Australia, uh, both before and during and, and since uh, COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic. But particularly uh, the testing of COVID, flu AB and RSV for both uh, older adults and young children has been very much on the radar here. Um, and that's occurred uh, mostly in emergency departments so that clinicians can make really informed clinical decisions about bed allocation, about uh, treatment, linkage to care, uh, and also in intensive care units where uh, you know have critically ill uh, individuals uh, where clinicians are looking to basically try and treat uh, patients most effectively particularly around carbapenem uh, resistant uh, um, pathogens and uh, wanting to avoid uh, further um, pathogenesis amongst uh, really ill individuals. Hospital acquired infections uh, are very much into the focus here in Australia as they are in many other parts of the world. Uh, diseases like uh, C. difficile, uh, methicillin resistant staph, staph aureus, vancomycin resistant. So all of those bugs that uh, essentially, you know, can be acquired or transferred within hospital settings um, are of an increasing concern. Uh, and also we see a move to uh, expert testing because of its portability uh, to remote indigenous settings uh, across Australia and also into regional government laboratories, plus some private labs. So I think, um, the fact that it's an accurate and, and very portable closed system uh, means that it has utility in many places and we're seeing that uptake expanding more and more here in Australia. Wow. Well, for, for those of us in, in industry, Stephen, it's, it's very apparent where the uh, economic and health outcome considerations are obvious, but you know, what, what have been the determinations in Australia that have driven uh, such, such broad uptake? Yeah, that's a good question because often the economics is around uh, molecular testing is, and particularly the point of care isn't something that gets discussed widely, although that is changing because as decision makers and policy drivers uh, and also, you know, financial uh, officials within organisations have to think more and more about uh, being um, mindful of where they spend their money, we're starting to see a lot more um, work describing uh, economic, well, health economic decision-making 
So for example, the fact that you can test for uh, SARS-CoV-2, flu AB and or RSV in an emergency department immediately allows both clinicians and other administrators to determine whether or not a person requires a bed. So we all know what a hospital bed costs. Um, and mm. if you can avert you know, mm. uh, just one unnecessary uptake of a bed, you're already starting to create you know, an economic situation that is really mindful of not only a clinical decision pathway, but also a financial one. So I think we're gonna see more and more focus around uh, economic, uh, well, particularly health economic decision-making. Uh, I think that's one really good example, but probably the most recent powerful example is a report that I saw published by Australia's federal government around the number of individuals that did not have to be evacuated from uh, remote um, towns and or communities here in Australia during COVID. And by having uh, expert tests available uh, on site in many of those particular communities, averted a minimum of $300 million in extra federal costs because they were able to make really clear and accurate and fast uh, decisions around the results that they were obtaining from expert. Scott, how would, how would you describe point of care testing in Canada? And also as a corollary, how does it compare to what's happening in Australia and, and what Steve has just described? Yeah, um, you know, there, I, there is some testing that is performed point of care and is established uh, within the Canadian healthcare paradigm. Uh, those, that, those point of care uses tend to be still within the hospital, just beside the bed. Uh, I'm thinking of blood chemistry, certain blood chemistry testings. But in terms of molecular diagnostics for infectious diseases and, and um, certain cancers, certain genetic disorders, the, the stuff that Cepheid does, um, we did see some progress towards point of care testing as an emergency response brought about by the pandemic, but certainly nowhere near the, the broad split, uh, the the broad spectrum impl uh, implementation that we see in Australia. Uh, in terms of comparing the two countries, I think there are a lot of similarities as to where point of care testing can do the most good. Uh, and again, perhaps Australia has got there first in, in some respects. Um, and I would put those into two broad buckets. You know, uh, and obviously this is, this is a, a gross risk of oversimplifying, but you have spaces within urban populations where point of care testing can really help bring healthcare to the people that are not accessing the traditional healthcare channels. These people tend to be marginalized um, or, or just don't know how to access the traditional systems because they're new to the country. And then the second broad bucket is uh, as kind of alluded to earlier, uh, rural isolated populations that tend to be northern in Canada, uh, perhaps also northern in Australia, um, where not only might they also be suffering from marginalization and inability to access traditional channels just through either um, distrust of them or not having the know-how how to find them, but also have the, the challenge of geography. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think that's true within the two the two countries, and I really hope that point of care testing uh, can spread further into those spaces to really do a lot of good in both those countries. Well, no, that's great, Scott. I mean, this is this is one of the reasons why we were so excited and are so excited about having you and Stephen on is is to really compare um, Canada and Australia. You know, they're, they're both two large countries where where most of the population is in a small region country due to history and climate. And in Canada, it's along the U.S. border. In Australia, it's along the East Coast. But outside of those few favorite regions, Australia is dealing with, you know, heat and, and physically remote or uh, otherwise or culturally isolated communities. And in Canada, it's the cold. So, you know, how do we how do we successfully deal with the dual challenges of, of climate and, and physical or, or cultural isolation of communities? Um, you know, Scott, what, what are you seeing in, in the Canadian context? And, you know, is there a plan to address some of those barriers? Cold climate, 
means that people tend to stay indoors more often. Uh, it makes lots of challenges with regards to getting fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, proper nutrition up, up to some of these communities. You know, there, you have situations where the roads only exist in the winter when the ice is frozen and then melt in the summer. And then conversely, uh, planes and airplanes are able to get up into these regions during the summer, the warmer seasons, but in the winter, the, the runways disappear or the weather just becomes too harsh to land. Um, and that combined with so social economic disparities that are, are rooted in a history of, you know, uh, colonialism uh, leads to further barriers to accessing proper health, further risk factors to, towards um, uh, catching and transmitting communicable diseases. So, yeah, the, the weather and the history, the social economic disparities brought about by historical context that go along with the, the weather challenge makes uh, makes these regions a hotbed for uh, communicable disease and it, and it makes these regions a place where point of care testing can really really do a lot of good um, relative to other regions where it could still do good but here clearly there's a there's a crucial value Steve what about in Australia what's been the experience there to segue a little off of what Scott was saying too I, I think the, the probably the first point that I'd make is Australia's had a a decade of practice in terms of uh, you know opportunity to become um, really you know really refined in its implementation of molecular point of care testing you know across a range of settings, and that's just not you know within urban um, hospitals or laboratories where it is commonly used. Uh, it does extend itself into you know those rural and remote areas where you know heat is 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 a real issue. But having said that, there's a whole range of mechanisms now that have been developed, built upon, learnt from, uh, in terms of both supplying and maintaining um, expert testing across those remote settings. So, for example, there's one um, particular organisation that runs 105 instruments across a network of Indigenous uh, health primary healthcare settings. And the training that sits around that, the governance that sits around that, uh, the quality assurance that sits around that, the constant monitoring, you know, it's taken 10 years for that to become, you know, a, a current overnight success. So I think with the, with the network in place and with it being highly functional, um, heat, like the cold, just gets managed. Uh, you set up a whole range of mechanisms and monitoring systems that enable that to happen. Uh, it's not 100% perfect, but it works extremely well. Uh, and that's in collaboration with, you know, courier companies and transport companies and uh, remote control companies. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, very too. Uh, yeah, exactly. Getting, you know, quality assurance products to some of these locations, you know, when there's a risk that the courier might just leave a packet of, of um, quality control sitting on the dashboard of their vehicle, you know, on a 40 degree uh, Celsius day. Um, you know, all of those things, you know, you just flip all that into cold uh, and, you know, you, you reverse engineer all of that sort of management structure, um, either now and or into the future. Um, so uh, I think that, uh, yeah, it's not without its challenges. I don't want to present a, a scenario here that says, you know, it's, it's, we've got it nailed. Um, but it is fairly seamless with, you know, lots and lots of practice. But yeah, it takes, you know, a huge amount of work and evidence, I might add, to convince policymakers to part with money to be willing to support, you know, that kind of initiative. You've got to have a very good use case, but you've also got to have a very strong economic case for why yeah. you should test at the point of care versus sending like we do here in a sample in Australia here, sending a sample 2000 kilometers, you know, from a remote location to a centralized uh, laboratory in a, in a regional or capital city. Well, and Scott, it's interesting to, to hear Steve speak about what's happening in Australia, because 
um, you know, it, that country really is much further along than Canada is, it certainly seems, in terms of point of care testing. Can you give us a sense from your perspective and from your professional experience why Canada is so much further behind than our fellow Commonwealth member? Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, maybe that question could also be phrased to Steve as, uh, why is Australia so advanced, right? I, I mean, clearly Australia is a world leader and is leaving uh, a bunch of nations behind. Um, and I, I will, so I would say in a nutshell, as Steve mentioned, uh, for for reasons that perhaps he can discuss, these systems got put in place years ago, um, prior to the pandemic. And when the pandemic happened, these testing networks that were already in place and already sort of accepted at a national uh, level, cultural level, were able to be pivoted in an agile manner to help address the pandemics. Uh, and as mentioned, you know, the, the, the Cepheid device, the expert device, has a large test menu and you can sort of add um, uh, diagnostics for this or that pathogen as you go. Um, and so both given that given that large menu design and the agility of, of uh, developing new tests in the face of the pandemic, it's really it's really sort of proven its worth not only as a day in day out um, testing model, model way of thinking but as a now as a sort of pseudo sentinel system in the face of potentially upcoming new pandemics in contrast here in canada uh in large part we acted we started implementing point of care testings and these these types of point of care or at least much closer to patient testing networks uh, particularly in northern, remote, isolated areas, um, as a response to the pandemic. So we were playing catch up in a sense, whereas Australia was already established and had these networks in place that could be pivoted. I think other potentially other differences between the two nations, uh, you know, the the way the the healthcare is administrated and administered in Canada. Each province is responsible for administering the healthcare within their own regions. Uh, whereas I get a sense that uh, in Australia, national level decision making is perhaps more common or more more uh, easily easily implemented, if I could put it like that. The Canadian diagnostics paradigm is traditionally relatively uh, centralized. If the test volumes are high enough. We generally traditionally have models of bring the test to the labs, have all the devices in the lab, have all the trained staff, you know, the know-how, the expertise in the lab, run the test and then send the results out. Uh, and that works really well for areas of the country where the infrastructure to support that is there. Uh, you know, the, the roads are getting cleared by snow plows in the winter. You know that courier truck's going to show up at 9 a.m. noon and 3 p.m. every day. Uh, you, you have you have the the lab hands ready and able to handle the volumes. Uh, but it does leave sort of again the 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 places that just don't have access to that kind of infrastructure in the lurch, and it leaves the people that don't know how to access those traditional channels, even if they're in a highly urbanized area with with tons of infrastructure, also in the lurch. So hopefully the the pandemic can help spar that that, that yeah motion. well and yeah I, I getting getting more access uh, to to point of care testing perhaps to self collection when when systems are validated and 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 then making sure that that's done without without sacrificing without sacrificing quality of care improving access to care while maintaining quality of care um, is certainly I think where we're all striving and and that kind of brought me to the the next question on our kind of flow um which i was going to ask steve which is you know how did we do that the, the australia you've rolled out you know access much more broadly than what we see in, in canada thus far you know how have you done that without risking a, a, a fall off in the quality and, and accuracy of testing you know what are the systems that needed to go in place with with some of these um 
some of these networks to make sure that um, there aren't systemic errors or, or process errors coming in. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that I would say too, and that is that um, um, let's not forget the ever increasing um, patient focused, patient driven uh, preferences for testing as well. I think they're starting to play a, a much bigger part in how it is that organisations and or, or health systems are responding, you know, to not only access to care, but also, uh, you know, the diagnostic return uh, around that care. I think we're starting to see that have, you know, more and more influence over time, certainly here in Australia, to the point uh, where, um, you know, the huge push for uh, human papillomavirus testing to, you know, have a um, uh, national self-collection guidelines established, which were just reviewed here again just recently. Uh, and with the bulk of that work still being done in centralised labs, as, as Scott was mentioning. But over time, uh, you know, that is likely to push out into more rural and remote parts of the country, because otherwise, how do women access uh, testing, uh, you know, to ensure that they, uh, that we can prevent uh, as best as we can cervical cancer? But, you know, of course, one of the things that is very much on the agenda here is, well, how does this get paid for in the medium and the long term? Certainly, you know, under the allocation of federal funding, you know, you can conduct a, a whole range of different testing for uh, key populations, um, uh, hard to reach populations, indigenous populations. But how do you sustain that in the long term? So the whole question around testing rebates is very much on the agenda here or reimbursement, as I think you might call it. Um, mm -hmm. how, how are you going to make that happen? Um, so there's another round of evidence that's required to, you know, justify a use case for that kind of positioning. And Scott, um, Cameron and Steve were talking just uh, a couple of minutes ago about quality assurance. So it would be interesting to hear the, the Canadian perspective on quality assurance too and, and whether Canada actually uh, values quality assurance in the same way as it's valued in Australia, or do we have a different approach? Well, well I think that the short answer is absolutely, of course we do. Um, I think, you know, again, as one of these benefits of the pandemic, uh, if I could say that, we saw that point of care testing paradigms can work. Uh, we sort of, a lot of the naysayers were shot down. We have this proof of concept that we can bring point of care testing into communities or into uh, non-traditional spaces in urban areas and the world won't explode. Um, the testing can be implemented uh, responsibly and the results can be reported out, et cetera. But these systems were set up in an emergency mindset, making emergency level decisions. And it's one thing to have a system, a proof of concept system that works for two years or three or four it's another thing to have a sustained lasting system or systems that go on for 20, 30, 40 years. And a part of making sure that you have that sustainment and that robustness is going to be bringing in the, the quality aspects, the quality controls, the quality assurances, proficiency testing programs. Uh, and that's a part of the puzzle that still needs to get figured out in its entirety, along with what to do with the data once it's generated, who owns it, how does it move from who, from here to there and, and make sure that it's reported accurately and maintained accurately. Um, but, but yeah, so definitely high, high, highest to highest of values when we're thinking long-term and what our healthcare system will look like 30, 40, 50 years from now, um, 100%, 100%. Yeah, and we see it as a primary, corner, primary cornerstone um, to help take away that argument around, well, you know, you have quality assurance within laboratory systems. Um, here it is, it doesn't matter where molecular testing is conducted. There has to be a stringent quality assurance uh, framework that is in line with federal and state regulations. It's inarguable. And in fact, uh, one, of, uh, one organization I know of has an entire team who is actually dedicated to monitoring uh, quality control, um, and also uh, test operator performance and proficiency, uh, checking on uh, instrument uh, error rates. I mean, 
their weeks and months and years are consumed just with the whole quality assurance framework that they not only um, comply with, but they also provide all the competency training and the training frameworks that sit around all of that as well. Stephen, you're, you're getting me thinking, and I'd like to ask an additional question for, for you and Scott. You know, I, I've certainly interacted with some policymakers that have said the, the thought, you know, point of care is almost optional and we'll, we'll get around to it if and when we want. But I almost see a generational viewpoint where um, younger patients are saying, no, I'm not going to take a whole morning to, you know, or half my day or full day to line up for a medical appointment that, that happens three hours late uh, to maybe get a sample collected, to then have to go back to get a result and are just not going to put up with it when the technology exists for that to be self-collected or done at point of care and, you know, reported after, you know, in the time it would take to go have a cup of coffee. Um, is, is that something that either of you see as an inevitability that, that really policymakers should be prepared for? Well, it's actually happening already. It's been, I don't know if you've heard of the Dean Street Clinic in London, but no, it, no. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a clinic that's been set up for many years now. Um, it has what's called a, a, an expert infinity machine. That's an automated machine that can basically run, you know, uh, 48 uh, or more tests at any given time. You go into the clinic, you tap some details into an iPad, you go to the desk, you collect a sample collection device, you self-collect that sample, you take it back to the desk, you go out the door, and in less than 24 hours, they send you back a result to say your, your, your results are either negative or you need to see a clinician. Um, so, you know, that kind of semi-drive-through approach to testing um, already exists. Scott, what would your thoughts be there? Yeah, it's certainly very interesting question. So, so going back to your initial premise of uh, uh, a generation gap, you know, the, the millennials becoming adults now and seeing the world in a different way. Uh, you know, I, I definitely agree uh, that you can now purchase anything off of a website and have it show up at your door. You can order a pizza and, and watch the delivery, uh, the delivery driver on a map right up to your front door. Perhaps, yeah, I, I would, I would agree with the idea that um, perhaps younger generations coming up have a different sense of services coming to me versus me going out to services. I guess for me, where the buck stops is going back to that quality aspect and responsible testing, because uh, it isn't pizzas, right? Um, there's much more consequences. Yeah, if just a bit correctly, right? Um, so I do, I could see the want there and I, I can see testing paradigms moving in that direction. It just has to be done responsibly, making sure we're taking the, um, the quality along with it. And, and also the linkage, the care, uh, you know, there is a danger to having people diagnosed in a room by themselves and having then nowhere to go or not understand where to go to get the proper care, both physical and mental. We're nearly out of time, um, guys. This this has just been so great. And um, thank you. Before, but before we go, uh, you know, where where do you both see where do you see point of care testing going in the next few years? Um, maybe um, Stephen, we can get you lead off with with Scott to follow and, and just what's where do you see it unfolding? What's what 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 should we expect in the next few years? Well, to Scott's a really good point about uh, younger generations. Um, I think that that patient focused um, um, attention to medical care is going to be a challenge, uh, and I and I strongly agree around the need for uh, caution um, and to uh, keep a handbrake on the on you know the potential cavalier approach. Um, there are concerns around you know. While you get a package in, so it says this is how you read the result. Um, um, there's the question about a the quality of that that test and also the interpretation of that test, um, and the cautions that sit around that. But at a molecular level, uh, which is where I prefer to sit, uh, simply because it is accurate. Uh, 
um, and also you know provides uh, or usually sits within a quality assurance framework. We're going to see, I think, a lot more host response testing. Um, so looking for markers, uh, particularly in relation to cancers. Um, expert uh, already runs uh, bladder cancer, uh, tests for acute myeloid leukemia, uh, breast cancer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so these host response driven tests, I think will become very valuable, particularly in lower resource settings where access to care is even more constrained, um, but they'll have utility elsewhere as well. Um, and I think we'll see um, an expansion of, of test menus that basically um, allow us to stay on top of uh, current viruses such as uh, you know COVID and flu A, flu B, but also thinking more about you know um, accessing hard to reach populations. So, for example, the expert um, hepatitis C finger stick test has had a rapid rise in uptake here in Australia. I would be remiss if I didn't. You know, mentioned the need to push back more on antimicrobial resistance. Sure. Uh, the huge amount of effort. No, arg no argument here. Yeah. No, no, I'm sure there's not. Um, you know, we're rapidly running out of antibiotic options. That's why tests like um, uh, expert Carbara become really important, but also others, you know, like um, expert uh, TB XDR, so that clinicians can make informed decisions about. Uh, what are the best drugs to treat TB for? Um, so that continual pushback on on antimicrobial resistance, I think, um, will need to you know continue you know at a global scale and with global cooperation if we're going to even remotely uh, you know push back to the kind of levels that we're going to need to see in the future. So look, there are just a few probably key takeaways from me, Cameron. Yeah. Scott, what what would be what would be the vision you? you have and what should we be watching for in point of care in the next few years? Yeah. So as mentioned previously, so, so first off, let me, let me first say that I, I agree with uh, everything Steve said. I think we're going to see different types of tests speaking in the molecular space and in the infectious yeah. diseases space in the space that, that, that we work in. Um, we're going to see different types of tests looking at host response and other, and other ways of um, detecting infections. Uh, we're going to see broader adaptation of menu at point of care. So, uh, you know, once these point of care networks are established, and we've seen this in Australia, uh, they can be retooled to take on new test types with a relatively low bar compared to establishing the networks in the first place. Uh, and thirdly, as again, as I said before, you know, we have, we've built out some networks, some examples, some proof of concept uh, uh, as a result of the pandemic. But now really putting in those reinforce, that reinforcing rebar, that is the controls and the quality management systems around it so that these things uh, won't start failing catastrophically in two or three years, but will last for, for years and years and years. Uh, then finally, I would say, um, kind of related to point two, uh, uh, with regards to being able to put more tests into the, the point of care uh, testing networks, um, these networks can start to act as advanced surveillance systems for new potentially pandemic pathogens things that look a lot like the last one, but are slightly different. And certainly, um, Cepheid as a company has demonstrated in the past the ability to develop new tests with high agility uh, when, when new pathogens uh, uh, or jump into human populations or just, a, just occur and you know, are found to infect humans and, and cause high morbidity and mortality. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, what I, that's what I think we have to look forward to in, in Canada. And gentlemen, I'm just going to jump in with one final question. And because we are pretty tight to time, I'm going to give you 30 seconds or less to uh, to help us out with an answer in terms of what this means for patients moving forward. You've described what the what the future may be. What does that mean for patients? Look, I think um, one of the underlying 
pillars of the Canadian identity, whether you realize it consciously or not, is this universal access to equitable health care for all Canadians. So that's a part of, you know, our bragging uh, portfolio on the world stage. And we don't actually hit that ideal in all cases. And the pandemic shown that you know, we have marginalized peoples that are not getting that equitable access to care. Um, I think point of care is one of the pieces that can help bridge that gap and get us to where we want to be. Um, and, uh, and I'll leave it at that. And I would extend that to say that it is that access that, that really, you know, opens the door to equity, right? Um, and, and I don't think it's dissimilar here. I, I think it's a it's a huge driver of what motivates a whole range of stakeholders to want to make that uh, you know that accurate molecular testing you know more readily available. It is about you know being able to diagnose faster, which in turn means that you treat faster, which in turn means there's less impact for the patient or the client or the customer, however you want to frame that term. Um, but it's about ensuring that, you know, um, uh, why should I be disadvantaged simply because I, you know, I'm not a part of the 80% of Australians who live on the eastern seaboard, you know, of this country. Um, you know, many, many years ago, um, you know, the Flying Doctor Service was established here in Australia mm -hmm. and that service is, you know, remote Australia. And now, under certain conditions, they and others, you know, actually use expert testing as a part of that service delivery so that, you know, they can achieve many of the things we've already talked about today. And that is, you know, more informed uh, clinical decision making, but in, you know, a very regulated um, quality assurance framework that ensures that the result that is being generated is the right result. Uh, which that in turn means that, you know, there's less impact uh, on that individual and also improves, you know, and also accelerates, you know, a better health outcome. Well, that, I think that's a, a great, great place to leave off. Um, and, um, you know, I'm very convinced that, that all this work will positively impact lives across, across both our countries. And, um, and that's great. So I, I really want to conclude by thanking um, thanking you Scott and you Stephen for joining us and for giving such uh, well considered um, and um, and uh, and candid responses using your full expertise and experience so uh, thank you so much for joining us today and being with us and it's a it's a pleasure to have you here thank you I'm Cameron Groom and I'm Catherine Clark till next time